Okay, let's continue. So we have the concept of state and dynamical variables have been radically changed and in, there is an equation which is like a wave equation but not a wave equation. It's uh, sort of a very characteristic equation. And expectation value of the dynamical variables are the ones which correspond to classical dynamical variables. And that's why we had to choose the operators to be, to be Hermitian. Now, the important concept we have come across to do is the conservation of probability, this one. Well, this is a very important uh, statement, obviously. We have to ensure that if the system is Hamiltonian, then if this is normalized at some time, at a given time, it should stay normalized. It shouldn't de decohere. If it decoheres, of course, there must be an interference and non-permission interferences to the system. But if there are no external interference to the system, how do we guarantee that this entity stays normalized? Because it, it is a very important, there are two important postulates or axioms of the probability theory and our, if we have a probabilistic interpretation of the physical system, it's, we should always stay consistent in agreement with these axioms. Now, as you know quite well, and we are going to use it very extensively in the second part when we are constructing relativist quantum mechanics, and the equation which guarantees the, which guarantees the conservation of the probability at all time is given by an equation of this form, which is known to, with the name continuity equation, continuity equation. Here, psi mod squared is the probability density, therefore any change in that, in the way to increase or decrease is compensated algebraically by the outflow or inflow of the probability current. This J is the probability current. CC is complex conjugate. So that equation obviously is a beautiful equation because it tells you, as I said, the change in the probability density in a certain region in a unit volume is, should be due to outflow or inflow of the probability current. Why it is important? Because it is the one which establishes contact with the classical physics. What happens in classical physics? There is mechanical motion along a given trajectory, right? Under the influence of an external force. Here, we are saying that if it is moving out, there is the probability decreasing in here, there is an outflow of the probability current. Very much like the fluid dynamics, remember? The density of a fluid, if it is changing, according to Mr. Bernoulli's laws, it obeys an equation of that form, and the, the J is replaced by the velocity field, because the, flu the fluid is moving away or moving towards us thus changing the density in here or decreasing the density in here. So it is a beautiful phenomenon, uh, not only physically, but mathematically also, because the physical interpretation is, uh, ensures the corresponding correspondence principle with the classical physics vis-a-vis -vis the motion. What is the motion? Motion is mimicked by this equation. And also it's going to guarantee the conservation of the probability. How do I do that? I integrate this equation. Oh, by the way, I, I, I thought you all know the derivation of this. How do you derive this using the Schrodinger equation, right? You multiply this equation by psi star, and then you take the conjugate equation and multiply it by the psi, and subtract side by side, because there's an i taking the conjugate equation changes sign, so you indeed get d by dt of psi mod squared in one side, you rearrange everything, you get the current in this form. So, as I said, in probably at the level of 300 course, you have seen this derivation, so that's I don't get into that. So when you integrate this equation over all space, 
d cube x d by dt is high mod squared plus d cube x divergence of j is equal to zero. I haven't done anything. I have just integrated this. If I move this time derivative out of the integral, then it becomes a straight derivative. It's a partial derivative because psi is a function of x and t. If I take it out, it becomes a part straight derivative because the x dependence is integrated out. It only This integrated psi mod squared only depends on t. Therefore, this becomes d by dt, d cube x. Now, let me write explicitly the dependences so that you see why this dependence is integrated out, so there is no x dependence left. If whatever we obtain in here, it should be a function of t, thus taking straight derivative makes sense, okay? So is, what is the right-hand side? Right-hand side is minus d cube x, divergence of j of x t, again, x and t. Well, you may say, oh, this is right-hand side is not zero. It is a non-zero quantity, thus the probability may not be conserved. Here comes the beauty of this a consistent mathematical scheme. Now, what are the things? This is a loop, a circular loop, really. We have started with the introduction of this concept as the probability amplitude. We have taken the mod square and integrated, and we have set it equal to 1. What is implicit in this equation? You see how physics and mathematics beautifully intermingle with each other. Well, this is giving you an equation to, uh, to correspond to this basic axiom of probability theory. It also tells you that psi is a square integrable function. It puts certain mathematical constraint on it. If it is not in the square integrable class, this integral may blow up. It may not carry any meaning. So it must have give. First of all, it should have a finite value. Then the finite value is adjusted to be equal to 1, square integrability. So the idea is that this square integrability of this guarantees the vanishing that of that surface integral. I assign this a private homework. Please do it on your own. Well, a warning, sometimes when I assign a private homework, it may be asked as a, as a quick, simple question in an exam or a, a sudden quizzes. Therefore, please do it on your own. Square integrability puts, of course, it gives you the, the, a certain, uh, tells you that psi should have a certain behavior at large distances so that there is no uh, singularities coming there. So the, impose that condition on the computation of this j and this surface integral. Well, by the way, perhaps you don't wish to do it the volume integral of a divergence. Use the Gauss theorem to convert into a surface integral, right? ds times the j of xt. What is this? It is the surface encompassing the volume under question, right? Divergence of a j is equal to the surface integral of the j itself if there is a boundary. In, in principle, the boundary is at infinite. But you have to get the conditions of the behavior of that at large distances, which is going to guarantee that that surface integral vanishes. Due to that fact, that due to the functions being square integrable probability, it's a total probability is concerned. How beautiful, right? Square integrability, that is, there exists a total probability guarantees that it's also conserved thanks to that continuity equation. So we are coming to a sort of end to this quick review of the basic paradigms of the new theory, that is the quantum theory. It is the following now. What is the so-called basic postulate of the quantum theory, which is also known as the Copenhagen interpretation?
Well, this is a, such a beautiful, simple principle, that's why it's so important. It tells you that if you have a complete basis, in terms of which you can expand an arbitrary state, as a if you write it as a superposition in terms of a complete basis, then the physical information contained in your state, you started with, is contained in the expansion. You may say, what else you could have? Well, it's not as simple as that. Mathematicians needed to prove it. Von Neumann, etc., were one of them. But the expression is rather trivially simple, so anybody is willing to accept it, right? A state can always be expanded in terms of a complete orthonormal basis. Orthonormality is not that important. You can always normalize it, right? Using Schmidt orthogonalization property. So. Then, psi this xt is going to be expanded in terms of these phi n of xt, if you want. If this is complete, then this is expanded in terms of that. Whatever physical information you have in the state abstract is contained in the expansion. That's the famous Copenhagen interpretation as simple as that. Then if you take the psi, it impose the normalization condition on here. Any physical state cannot be an arbitrary function. They must be normalized functions. Probability postulate, axiom, sorry, probability axiom requires that this is to be normalized. When you apply this there, they are normal, complete. Therefore, what you have is n cn squared. So you have a beautiful expression now here. Again, so simple, you say, what, uh, what is the point writing such stupidly simple things? Well, these are the basic axioms of quantum theory. Well, that requires the meaning, to know the meaning of these CN coefficients. CN coefficient is finding that full physical system in any one of these phi n's. So when you get the CN mod squared, it's the probability of finding that general state in along you know, there's infinitely many right basis vectors along that particular basis vector. It's the probability of finding the system in that particular state. So their sum should add up to one because of the normalization, or the, because it's going to be in only one of those states. Infinitely many, but like a dice having six faces, when you throw the dice, you'll find when any one of these six faces. And finding any one of the six faces is 100%, right? Because, as I said, tepes üzerine duracak hali yok yani. Bir yüzlerden biri gelecek orada çünkü. So why did I mention this postulate? Because first of all, this postulate is the, at the backbone of quantum theory by a Copenhagen people. Second, it's going to help us in identifying certain crucial basis vectors. Because if we always need a complete orthonormal basis to use this postulate, the Copenhagen uh, interpretation basic axiom, then we need to find certain basis vectors. What are they? First of all, we have to look for good Hermitian operators. Well, we know that the good Hermitian operators are X's and P's, although we don't intend to use them simultaneously because we cannot determine them, measure them simultaneously. X is a good Hermitian operator, P is a good Hermitian operator, so is Hamiltonian, so is angular momentum. So any derivative, any derived operator from these basics. X and P still continue to play a central role, although they are not to be used as simultaneous labels of the same system. This is Hermitian, right? So let me define its eigenvalue problem. Now, in order to distinguish, 
If I continue using the same notation for the operators and eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so in order to distinguish this from the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, I will use OP for the operator. My previous students know that whenever there is a danger of confusion, I use this OP label. XOP is the X operator. X is the eigenvalue, is a C number, that's the position of the object. You can measure it by the ruler. Well, this is her mission, therefore its eigenvectors are orthogonal. Well, we normalize them, thus they are orthonormal. However, being a continuous system, not a discrete one, the orthonormality is via Dirac delta, not Kronecker delta. Meaning x and x prime are on top of each other, that's infinite. Is it strange? Well, it's strange. It's, it's sharp, 100% or infinitely many percent. Just. So this spectrum is something like that. That's the strange feature of continuous systems. And they are also complete. This is the orthonormality, and completeness is the following. Unit operator. One is one, identity is the unit operator. This is the completeness. I will tell you what is completeness by. This is the, in the Hilbert space of the X operator, in its eigenvectors and our sta our abstract states live. This is in its dual Hilbert space. One is the bra, uh, cat is the, the other is the bra. Cat and the bra. This notation is due to Mr. Dirac and it's a beautiful notation because it's going to help us to move away from the specificity of certain spaces. You have a space of functions of x, space of functions of p, so that's not that good because you may have space of functions of other <coughs> variable like energy, Hamiltonian. If you have so many different spaces, you have to have a is representation independent formulation. This is going to help us to have a representation independent formulation. I will explain what. What do I mean? So let me move this p down in here. Then I can write its eigenvalue problem similarly. p operator and p eigenvector and p, p. op is labeling the operator. Without op, they are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and they are ordinary c numbers. And how is its normalization? This uh, normalization is again being a continuous variable is via Dirac delta sense. Again, it has a sharp Dirac delta type of uh, position, uh, obviously. And its uh, nor completeness is given in this manner identity operator. That is, you take one from the cat space, the other from the bra space, associate, you get operator, identity operators. And that's the completeness. I will, in the functional sense, I will define also what the completeness relation means eventually. So these two are good basis vectors, good candidates to be always used as basis vectors, and I will use them extensively along the way. You'll notice that. So good bases are one basis is this, or the other basis is this. As I said, there could be other bases like ENs for the discrete or continuous energy is associated with the Hamiltonian. I'm not now going to elaborate it further, but you have to know that the X and P are not the only bases. Energy eigenvectors could be also bases, discrete or continuous, doesn't matter. Perhaps I shouldn't put e N in here. You're sort of giving you the wrong impression that energy should always be discrete. No, free particles energy is continuous. 
three particle is the simplest part quantum mechanical problem, and it's, it happens to be continuous, really. We are going to discuss them in detail eventually. Fine. Now let me go from abstract Hilbert space state concept. Now this. And the wave function I have been talking about for, since the middle of the last lecture, which satisfies an ordinary explicit Schrodinger equation. Well, psi is an abstract Hilbert space vector whose components might be either psi of x t or psi of phi of p t or chi of e t. That is each labeled by x, p or the Hamiltonian. So there are components. This is an abstract Hilbert space vector. What do I mean? What I mean is first I, let me emphasize the analogy then I will proceed to demonstrate. Let's think of a vector. Well, ordinary, even you know from the primary school that a vector is an entity with an arrow on it, on, then uh, you can represent it as an arrow. Or you can use Mr. Descartes' notation and say it has a basis and sum over these uh, number of, depending on the number of dimension of the space you are in, this space is three dimensional, thus there are three basis vectors and the coordinates. So that's one way of representing pictorial. This is an analytic way of representing it. Basis vectors, coordinates, and the sum. Let me see whether I can have similar notation popping up in this Hilbert, fundamental Hilbert space. Well, there is a very nice and easy way of seeing it. My usual trick is I insert here an identity. Let me write it. I don't know whether I am allowed to <laughs> use eraser. Well, it's already done, therefore. So, this is an identity, right? Psi abstract Hilbert space vector is equal to a psi and it'll multiply it with an identity. It's again one, uh, the same thing. And what is it, a natural identity in here? I can think of either inserting this completeness. I know that this is identity, right? Or another identity, or this is or, dq p, p, and p. Or the energy, if you want to use the energy notation. Let's take the first one. What is the first one? The first one is d cube x, x, x and psi. Here it is. Compare sum, continuous sum, basis vectors, basis vectors, the complete and orthonormal, indeed, and coordinates, coordinates. Thus, the Schrodinger wave function, which satisfies that wave-like equation of Schrodinger, is nothing but, well, these are functions of t, nothing but this component of this abstract Hilbert space state vector along the position eigenvector basis. I can get a similar thing by using the second equation, exactly. dq p, p, phi of p, psi of t, that is our so-called phi p t. <clears throat> so it's really powerful. It is representation independent. So you can have formulation of the theory either in the x space or the, in the p space or the e space, but the formulating it in this abstract Hilbert space notation gives you the freedom of choosing any one of those representations. For example, for the hydrogen atom, uh, for example, some people uh, found that it is more appropriate to, you to go to the p space to get an algebraic description of the hydrogen atom, algebraic group-like representation. Therefore, this type of formulation gives you that it's, they are equally perfect. Either I can use the X space formulation or P space formulation. The, the very nature of the dynamics, the form of the potential, that's the dynamics, is telling you whichever representation you have to use. So this general formulation enables you to do that. Perhaps one last thing in this general formulation is that 
How do I define the normalization? The normalization is defined as such. Ordinary, number one. Now if I substitute now these explicit expressions in here, d cube x, x unit vector, psi of x t, and here the conjugate of it, so d cube x prime, x prime psi star of x prime t. So what do I get in the left hand side? I get in the left hand side d cube x d cube x prime x prime and x psi star of x prime t and psi of x t. It looks complicated but it's not. Thanks to the fact that these basis vectors are orthonormal. So it is d cube x minus x prime. You, I can carry out one of the integrations thanks to this Dirac delta. So I get what? I get d cube x psi of x t squared. And this is what? Equal to 1. You see? This is you are more familiar with because this you are more familiar with because this is the form that you have, you have obtained historically first till 1926. And so in the abstract Hilbert space notation, a shorthand way of expressing it that these vectors are normalized. And how do I represent these vector sets? That and their norm is through here. And we have required that it's one. It's a beautifully simple notation. Once you get used to it, you'll find yourself more comfortable. I think essentially that's all I wanted to talk about vis-a-vis uh, -vis the a lightning review of the basic paradigms of quantum theory. You have seen it several times, but at least to set the stage, I wanted to mention it once more as a sort of uh, semi-philosophical, semi-mathematical, and semi-physical thing. So you know everything about the quantum mechanical paradigms, the basic differences with the classical physics. So I am quite ready to turn my attention to uh, actual physical issues, but for that I have to introduce one more concept, that is the stationary state. Stationary state is, I'll use the both notations intermingably, that is either the abstract Hilbert space notation or the uh, Schrodinger wave function notation because I know that they are the coordinates. Either V arrow or V i. That's in the ordinary algebraic sense. The difference between these two, they are not the difference, they are complementary ways of describing the same things obviously. Now when you look at that Schrodinger equation once more, I usually I will prefer to write the Hamiltonian in the compact way, although psi of x t meaning that I have an explicit space of functions of x, thus I can write the Hamiltonian operator as the minus h bar squared over 2m del squared plus the v for velocity non-independent potential class. But anyway, let's keep it as compact as possible for shorthand psi of x t. Okay. Now, if this is separable, well, separability is guaranteed by the non-independence of the potential on the time. If potential is non-independent, for the velocity non-independence case, if the Hamiltonian is composed of kinetic energy, which is a, a function of p, momentum operator, right, right, p squared, and uh, plus a potential which is a function of x only, Obviously, mathematicians may have a half a page detailed proof of the separability. We accept their proof. We say it's separable. Then I can look for a solution of the following form. Perhaps I have to change this notation slightly so that I still keep using the psi. One is the capital psi, the other is the small psi. So I can look for a solution of the following form. xt is equal to psi of x and f of t that is in the factorized form space and time parts of the solution could be written in this factorized form. Then you substitute that factorized form into the equation, carry out a few steps of simple mathematical manipulations. 
right one side in terms of the little psi, the other side in terms of f. If well, left hand side depends on the x, the right hand side depends on the t, the therefore, then they should be equal to the same constant. That's the mathematician's way of working out the separability. Therefore, the t part can be solved automatically and you get, so I, I, I skipped those two steps. Please, you guys fill that in, okay? So ft comes out to be e to the minus i over h bar, i over h bar e t. This e is the e which appears in this equation. Thus, its meaning also emerges through this manipulation. Left hand side is a function of, right hand side is a function of t. They are equal to the same constant. Let's write it as c. Then that c comes here. You see that it's the eigenvalue of the h that this must be the energy because eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian we define as the energy. Therefore, that is the energy. This form of the solutions are known to be the stationary state solutions. Stationary state. That's a bit sort of paradoxical name, right? Because it's very much time dependent because the solution, you see, the, when you go back to the solutions, psi of x times that, e to the minus i over h bar times e, it oscillates. It is called stationary because, for, because of the specific form of this time dependence, expectation values are time independent. In stationary states, expectation values are time independent. Let's demonstrate that. What are the expectation values? of an observable A, it is defined as d cube x psi star A of psi. That's the expectation value. Well, in the abstract notation, let me write it in abstract notation first. That's the very defin simple definition. You write the psi in terms of those components in the x basis, you get to this one. Then you substitute the solutions in that form, little psi times f. f, this has the exponential time dependence with the plus sign, that has the minus sign, they cancel, and what you get then is d cube x psi star of x, a psi of x. You may ask, do I sort of imply a certain behavior for the operators themselves. Obviously, the operator shouldn't depend on time explicitly. If it depends on the time explicitly, then there is no way that its expectation value may be time independent. If it doesn't depend on time explicitly, there will be no time dependence brought in by the states. That's the point. That's why this, these states are called stationary, because expectation values are indeed time independent. And they are beautiful set of states because for those states, the Schrodinger equation is really reduced to energy eigenvalue equation. You see, Schrodinger equation is a very wave-like equation, but it's an interesting equation in its full generality. But for the stationary states, it automatically reduced the energy eigenvalue equation. A, a huge advantage. So from this point on, We'll say that we'll focus on stationary state solutions of most of the physical problems, provided that they are not explicitly time dependent, of course. For example, a system in an external radiation field, the states cannot be stationary because there is time dependence brought in by the light itself, wave itself. But for constant potentials, natural problem to look at is the stationary states, Thus, the equation to focus on is the energy eigenvalue equation. And if we, can, if we know the Hamiltonian explicitly, meaning that we know the potential dynamics as described by the potential, we can solve this equation exactly, or we can hope to solve this equation exactly. 
and we have the energy spectrum, eigenvalues, and solution eigenvectors functions. You can answer any question about the physical system once you have these expressions in your hand. Question. Can we always solve an energy eigenvalue function? Most often than not, we cannot solve them exactly symbolically. We can solve them exactly numerically with the advent of powerful computers, but if you want to solve them symbolically, almost 99.9% .9 of the problems you cannot solve exactly. Then you have to resort to approximation techniques. So this is the central equation, and we will look for approximation techniques to solve them. One of the most popular, of course, depending on the nature of the problem and the taste, one of the most popular approximation techniques is the Riley-Schrodinger perturbation theory. Riley-Schrodinger perturbation theory is As I said, one of the most popular, <coughs> well, actually, let me not refer to the names, perturbation theory. Riley has developed it in the 18th and late 18th century for the sound theory. It's a mathematical technique, of course, approximation. And Schrodinger picked it up and they applied it to the Schrodinger equation. So this perturbation theory is based on the following fact. They have this energy eigenvalue equation, and you can identify two pieces in the Hamiltonian. So this is the algorithm. That is, you have to be able to identify two pieces. One is the principal or large piece. The other is the so-called small piece, large and known. Known means when you take this Hamiltonian alone, you can solve the energy eigenvalue problem exactly. That's the so-called known piece. This is the small. So you, as I said, you have to be able to split the Hamiltonian into two. One is known and large, the other is small. You may say, what's small? It's an operator. Well, small in any basis as compared to the first one. Smallness is as compared to the first one and in a basis. What is the ideal basis? The eigenvector basis of this one is the ideal one. So in this eigenvalue basis, the energy eigenvalue in here is EM0, and this one is NH1. If this is known to be small as compared to them, then this algorithm works. These are the basic in the ingredients of the algorithm. If these conditions are satisfied, then you can have uh, the following, En, En0 plus G En1 plus G squared En2 for the non-degenerate case. Let, uh, let me illustrate the principle in the non-degenerate case before moving into degenerate. That is, based on the fact that you write H1 as G times V, a small coupling parameter, and you expand everything the Hamiltonian and the state functions and all that in terms of the G, and the energy can be written in that fashion. It is known to be convergent, thanks to people like von Hoff, von Neumann, etc. Then if you would like to, if G is small enough, you stop at the first level, or you retain the second if this vanishes. That's the at most we will go in this class. Then this is the correction to what? To here, due to that additional piece. Let me repeat again. You identify two pieces in the Hamiltonian given to you. One is the large and known part whose solution is known. This is known. And you'll find the correction over this due to that term H1, which is written as GV to identify the G. And there are similar corrections to the psi n. And we can work out the first order correction of psi n1 as well. And the formalism is known and is developed for the non-degenerate simple case and degenerate case. 
And I'm going to use the results of that formalism. I invite you to study your notes from last year or from the year before, 507. Let me summarize. Uh, there are well-known expressions in here, but I'm not going to write them down. The, non, the degenerate case is difficult. So let me explain what is the degeneracy. Degeneracy means if there is, if there are several states corresponding to given energy level, that level is known, said to be degenerate. If there is one level, one state, the state is non-degenerate. But physics is so that the universe is full of de degenerate examples. There are very few cases of non-degenerate. Let me explain. Perhaps explanation on specific example is more rewarding. And let's take the H0 is equal to Coulomb Hamiltonian. That is the so-called naive hydrogen problem, right? We know how to solve this. We know how to solve it exactly. I write it in this specific fashion because it's kinetic energy plus the potential energy a potential energy has that intrinsic minus sign in the front because it's a binding system and the electron and the nucleus attracts each other. That's the potential energy, V coulomb. And if you solve this exactly using Schrodinger theory, the energy spectrum comes out to be alpha squared over 2n squared times Me squared. I, I prefer to write it in this bit of beautiful fashion. Please get used to it. Alpha is the fine structure constant which is one of the most characteristic and representative constants of the quantum theory and its value is explicitly 1 over 137. It's e squared over h bar c. N is here and comes out to be 1 to etc. goes all the way to infinity. It's the principal quantum number. And the energy only depends on a single quantum number n. Although we know that in this problem, a complete set of compatible operators are composed of these three. And it is a complete set of compatible operators. We who, what we do is find its common eigenvalue problem. That is, we define the eigenvalues of these by the L label and these by the M label. Therefore, L squared on, if I label now the psi 0 and LM as L times L plus 1 H bar squared times psi and LM 0. And LZ on the state is M H bar on the state. And H is, on that state, is En, 0. So this, why we do that? I said set of compatible operators, meaning all these three commit, operators commute with each other. The first task is to identify a complete set of operators which commute mutually, so that you can use them simultaneously to label your physical states. So although I have three labels, to represent the state, only one of them appeared in here. So that state is degenerate. The number of degeneracy is n squared for non-spin case and 2n squared for the spin case. How do I know that? I know it from through the following reason. Now, if you go through again through course 300 or 431, I presume one of those simple courses, you see that we have these three labels, psi and LM0 and L is, and there is some relationship, restriction between them. For given L, M is restricted between minus L and plus L. Okay. Then L goes for given n. L goes from 0 to n minus 1. So if you really sum of all these things, the what do I mean? 
number of states. M equals minus L to plus L, 2L plus 1. <coughs> How do I do that? What are the number of states in here? 2L plus 1. And I have to run L from Z to my N minus 1. Sorry, that's the thing. What do I get N squared, right? You do this simple arithmetic sum using algebra. The number of degeneracy, that is, the possible values of the states associated with given N, which, only, which is the only quantum number entering into that energy expression, is N squared. If you include spin, 2S plus 1, so degeneracy becomes 2N squared. Obviously, except the ground state, in the no-spin case, hydrogen atom is fully degenerate. N equals 1 is 1, N equals 2 is 4, N equals 3 is 9. But if you include spin, even the ground state is degenerate. Therefore, you have to always use degenerate perturbation theory. And what are the now algorithm that we have obtained in the degenerate perturbation theory? Degenerate perturbation theory is rather subtle, really. Because when you have an energy level, you know that that energy level is a lump of states associated with this. That's the degeneracy. When you turn on perturbation, add H1, well, they may go and split. Some of them may stay clumped, but some of them may be split. Huh? Some of them may still have subdegeneracies. Some even may not. But there will, there will be a three-level splitting, but there will be, again, double degeneracy for each case. Stuff like that. When you turn off, then all these will come to here. But which one of these states it will come to? They all carry the same energy. Energetics is not sufficient to distinguish between the initial states. Therefore, there is a mixing problem. Some of you have done a bit of reading on the neutrino mixing or K-mixing, CP eigenstate mixing. You know that here is a simple, stupid quantum mechanics is telling us that there is a mixing going on. If you have done properly, you guys have done it properly last time. You have done it in detail. And those of you who have done it, please do a bit of reading through your notes. So degenerate perturbation theory involves several things. Now the energy corrections. State corrections and mixing. This wasn't there in the non-degenerate perturbation theory. Even zeroth level, when you turn on the perturbation and turn it off, the final zeroth order states will mix. It won't stay in any, you don't know which of those states it will go. So that mixing is a beautiful mixing. So if you please review your old notes, so that if you refresh your memory in the formalism, I will start by addressing the real hydrogen atom problem, which is I'm going to use all those techniques here. I think that's a good point to stop for today.